In college, I studied computer science and film production, but until I was given my first real job, I only ever mentioned the computer science because I was almost embarrassed. Embarrassed I wasn't fitting the STEM mold because I didn't understand what the value of art was. And if I couldn't answer that, I certainly couldn't tell you what the value of an artist was. Dumb blonde, very artistic. Well, an artist is a megaphone, an elaborate tool for communication. And who hires the artist? The patron. And so over the centuries, we've developed a triangular relationship between the artist, the patron, and the audience. And sure, we love the idea of an artist as a painter pursuing his passion alone in a vine-covered Parisian loft. Jack, I want you to draw me like one of your French girls. It's a very romantic idea, isn't it? Yeah, unless your dad's a wealthy banker, <coughs> César, well, then you're stuck like the rest of us trying to earn a living. Sorry, not sorry. Artists aren't special. It's how a community works. You make stuff, you get stuff. I help you, you help me. Deal! And so, what does a professional artist have to trade? The pretentious answer is inspiration, insight, the universal truth. Imagination. Yeah, the real answer is persuasion. Because artists, like everyone else, need to give back. And in return, they'll offer a megaphone to a patron who wants to tell the world something. Churchill wants to tell England to keep on fighting. Germany wanted the Tobel bombsite. We'll send her thousands of them in RAF planes. Ted Turner wants to tell America to save the environment. Our world is in peril. Gaia, the spirit of the Earth, can no longer stand the terrible destruction plaguing our planet. Amenhotep wants to tell his people that he is literally an immortal god. We are in serious trouble. And so there's been this triangular relationship between the professional artist, the patron, and the audience in one form or another since the dawn of tools. Because once a community has filled the lower rings of Maslow's hierarchy, they can spend extra resources on communication. Communication that goes beyond, like, Mastodon, there. And now is when you might say, hey, Laura, you're wrong. I'm an artist. We're all artists. But also, it does mean you're an artist. Yeah, your two-year-old's toothpick sculpture is a real work of art. Let me call up the Louvre. I'm sure they'll just throw out the Mona Lisa in exchange for that masterpiece. Children are terrible artists. Yeah, everyone can pick up a pen and paper and draw something. And look at you, you're both patron and artist, deciding the message, funding it, and crafting it to go out into the world. But I'm not talking about a hobby. I'm talking about the Sistine Chapel and, and the terracotta soldiers which I'm definitely not irrationally afraid of. I'm not. And they require a level of skill that's only achievable by the professional artist who has dedicated his life to perfecting his craft, which takes time. And lots of it. And money. Yeah, that's it. And which is why historically art and artisans were associated with kings and monarchs because funding a statue of yourself conquering those uncultured Celts was so much more effective than yelling. I want people to be afraid of how much they love me. Look at them all. Gilgamesh, Tutankhamun, Alexander. My favorite example, the ancient Assyrians. And the ancient Assyrians were a thing for like 2,000 years and nobody messed with them because they had these carvings in their palaces. You know, just the casual depiction of mass murder in the royal foyer. And let's say you're a chief of the neighboring steppe and you're cordially invited to meet the king and they say, thank you so much for coming. We understand it's not on your usual route, but we figured if we threatened your loved ones, you'd find the time to meet your new king. Do you like our new stone carvings? Well, this one is a picture of our king resting on a couch next to the severed head of the last king who resisted us and the lovely lady next to him. Oh, that's the dead king's wife, a charming woman, great sense of humor. On your right, you'll see the mural commemorating the last time we conquered our enemies and forced them to grind the bones of their own ancestors to dust. And if you look just beyond that, you can see the one of us getting our prisoners alive. Oh, the king will see you now. Blood, 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 and death. You know, I admit I get pretty angry when my internet pings out, but 2018 is not that bad. So, the triangular relationship between ancient artisans, kings, and cowering enemies slowly changed. The church rose in power, and throughout the Middle Ages, they were the near-exclusive patron, and their message wasn't nearly as violent. Glory, hallelujah. What did Leonardo da Vinci draw for his nine to five? Well, here we have Madonna and Child, and this is Madonna and Child, 
and this one, Madonna and Child. And if I may, this last one is actually also known as Madonna and Child. So the church funds the artists. The artists paint Mary and the angels, and that's how it goes for a little while. Obviously, the Renaissance is a lifetime's worth of art history, but I don't need to remind you that the church funded everything. Everything! Nearly everything. But this changed again with the rise of the merchant class. Pretty close to the church, but hey, they loved to commission art that said, I'm pretty awesome. Are you other rich dudes impressed? I have such taste and such class. Please like me. And eventually, the Dutch merchants did this so much they created a whole genre, the Dutch masters. Side note, some cool technology came out of that, but it's a story for another day. Another great story. After the merchant class, we see yet another shift which coincides with the decline of monarchy, America. Eh, technically the British colonies, who were taking a huge step past the Magna Carta and drafting a government of the people, by the people, and for the people, because the rise of the merchant class groin kicked the concept of div divine rule. And sometimes it went well, and sometimes people lost their heads. But along the way, we formed a new kind of art, art that is funded by the government to convince people to pass a constitution or fight for their country. I'm sure you've seen this snake published by your favorite pervert, Benjamin Franklin. And so for centuries, art is called upon to persuade people to support the New Deal or overturn prohibition or to start and end wars. It's where the patron is the state and the audience is the people. Uh, it's propaganda. <laughs> but hey, along the way, the LLC is invented, the economy grows, and soon we have companies rather than wealthy merchants. And these companies turn to Don Draper to help sell their products, and thus advertising is born. Commercials. Parallel to that, an entire industry is blooming in what is literally a desert, Hollywood. And it's an entirely new approach where the patron commissions are in order to charge admission on the back end and make a profit there. We've seen this model before at the World Fair and Tierpark Hagenbeck, but Hollywood was something else entirely. Marvel Comics, Walt Disney. Where Walt Disney and William Fox and Louis B. Mayer certainly, certainly controlled the message. But something was starting to fundamentally change that triangular relationship. If you've ever worked retail, you know it. The customer is always right. Translating that, the company is always going to bend to the will of the customers their patrons. And so between Mulholland Drive and Madison Avenue, we're starting to break the mold. It's a model where the patron and the audience are to some degree interchangeable. And that is what is really flipping cool about today. Because today the internet is taking a jackhammer to the barriers between the artist and the audience. And you can yell at George R. R. Martin to finish Game of Thrones in a way that nobody could bother Mark Twain. And if you really want more episodes of a TV show like say Veronica Mars, then you can fund a Kickstarter or create a critical mass of people to bother Netflix until they buy the rights to reboot your childhood. Everything's getting a reboot now. Okay, this can get ugly sometimes. Have you heard of Mass Effect? It's a three game trilogy where you spend years building a team of warriors to save the known universe. The average player took over 75 hours to get to the end, where the developers promptly decided to nuke everything. Spoiler, people were upset. So I got angry and upset and hurt. On the other hand, look at how Game of Thrones is giving its audience more of the characters that are popular. Lysa Mormont writes one letter in the books, but the audience loved her so much that we're getting so much more of her on the show. And same goes for Torment and the love of his life. Plus, thanks to the internet, we can create totally new kinds of art. Like Lucas the Spider, a character created for YouTube whose creator just picked up $1.2 million, which he put towards a college fund for his nephew who voices the spider. Hi, not, my name's Lucas. And after like eight minutes of pseudo art history, you're probably wondering why. Why is Laura talking about this? Well, I love the idea of creators forming a direct relationship with their audience to share their process and to give you a peek into the worlds that I'm building and the stories that I'm telling with fish and ships. And because the animated content, uh, well, it takes a ridiculous amount of time. And hey, someone might find this interesting. Since you're still watching, maybe that someone is you. My name is Laura. Thanks for watching.